The next topic is one that's near and dear to my heart, which is pharmacokinetics, or the uptake and distribution of inhaled anesthetics, which really is a topic that covers the factors that govern how anesthetics move into, within, and out of the body. It's a crucial factor in anesthesia. It's one that determines many aspects of anesthetic effects, inhaled anesthetic effects, including their workings, their toxicity, how they might affect muscles, how they might affect, indeed, all parts of the body. The focus of uptake and distribution usually is on the relationship between the alveolar and the inspired concentration. It's illustrated in this slide. The alveolar concentration is FA, and the inspired concentration is FI. This is the curve that you get for these four anesthetics when you deliver anesthesia using a non-rebreathing system. So this is a high flow system, non-rebreathing system. And there are two messages in this slide that you need to appreciate. The first is that the anesthetics are different in their position. And the second is that the shapes of each curve are the same. The shape of each curve takes the following form. There's an initial very rapid rise to a knee that's labeled one, and a secondary slower but uh, still fairly rapid rise taking place over the course of perhaps eight minutes to a second knee that's more difficult to distinguish and labeled two here. And from this, there's a third, still slower rise. And we need to understand the basis for these two messages, the difference in the position and the identity of the shapes. Now, we might explore this by talking about um, why the initial curve rise is so rapid, and in fact, this is related to the opposed or unopposed or partially opposed effect of ventilation to drive the alveolar concentration upwards. And we can help ourselves a bit if we talk about a time constant. Well, let's do that. A time constant. The time constant is, in fact, a time. And it's a time that can be calculated if we know two things about any system. One is the capacity of the system. And the second is the flow through that system. The time that results is the time to a 63% change in the concentration of whatever it is we're delivering to that system. So for example, if we had the lungs, the lungs have a capacity, and the lungs have a flow through them, the alveolar ventilation. What's the, what's the normal functional residual capacity of an adult patient? Give me a, an FRC, functional residual capacity. Give it. About two liters. About two liters. And what's a normal alveolar ventilation? It's about four liters. About four liters per minute, of course. So if you calculated for the lungs the time constant, it, it would equal 2 liters over 4 liters per minute. The liters cancel out, and the minutes go up here. And you'd see that the time constant for the lungs is a half minute. Half minute is the time it takes to produce a 63% change in some newly introduced gas, which means that if we're introducing some gas at time zero, there's nothing of the gas in the lungs. By the time we've gone one time constant, half a minute, we should be up to 63% of the way towards equilibrium. Very quick, very quick. In fact, we can think in terms of one time constant or two time constants, which would be 63% of what's left. That'd be up to 86%. Or three time constants, which would be 95%. Or four time constants, which would be 98%. In the case of the lungs, that'd be two minutes. Is there a gas for which the time constant applies that we use every day? What? Oxygen. Which is, say that again. What is that gas that we use every day? Oxygen. Oxygen. That's exactly right. So if you calculate or you measure, using a non-rebreathing system, the rate of change of oxygen concentration in the lungs, 
you get a curve like this, which is something we got in a couple of patients that we studied a few years ago. Within 30 seconds, we go up a change that's about 63%. A minute, we're up at about 86%. A minute and a half, we're getting close to 95, and so on. But the rise in FAFI for anesthetics isn't as rapid as for oxygen. Why is that? There must be some other factor that's coming into play. Anesthetic is brought into the lungs, and the rate at which it's being brought into the lungs and should change the concentration of the lungs is something we get from the time constant. But it doesn't quite work that way. We don't go up to 100% of what we're delivering. Why not? Something's opposing the effect of ventilation to drive the alveolar concentration upwards, and that something is? Uptake. Uptake. You got it all. Everybody, shout it together. Uptake. Uptake. Right. So now we need to say, what is uptake due to? And it equals three factors. What are those three factors? Anybody? Solubility. Solubility. If you don't know the answer to a question from here on out, it's going to be solubility half the time. Of course, half the time it won't be, but half the time it is. And we use lambda to designate solubility. What else, though? Cardiac output. Cardiac output. Good. And then one more factor, which is what? Arterial venous difference. Arterial venous difference for the anesthetic partial pressure. So we'll make it alveolar venous partial pressure difference. That's the same thing as arterial if we've got no ventilation perfusion abnormalities and no barrier to diffusion of anesthetic. How do we define solubility? The first of those factors. Anybody, how would you define solubility? I said to you, tell me what the solubility of nitrous oxide is. What would you say if I said that to you? Basically, you'd say it's a comparison of the concentration between two states where you have equal partial pressures. That's exactly right. So if you've got nitrous oxide in the lungs and nitrous oxide in the blood and the two are in equilibrium, then you might have this relationship. You might have 6% of some anesthetic. Could have been nitrous oxide, although you wouldn't be using 6%, would you? Not normally. Uh, but this might be desferane, or it could be some other anesthetic. And at equilibrium, you find that there's 3% in the blood. That's a concentration ratio that's produced of 3 over 6, or 0.5. And what that says is that the anesthetic likes to be in the blood about half as much as it likes to be in the gas phase, if anesthetics had likings, if we can anthropomorphize it. It says that the bigger this number is, the bigger will the uptake be. The smaller the number, the smaller the uptake will be. And here are such numbers. And indeed, for those of you that are taking your certifying exams or your board exams, these are numbers you've got to memorize. <laughs> they are numbers to remember. They're the, probably the most important numbers that are associated with any anesthetic. They group themselves, in, interestingly enough, into two groups. One is a group of poorly soluble anesthetics, the desferrin, nitrous oxide, and sevoflurane. The other, a group of moderately soluble anesthetics, like isoflurane, enflurane, and halothane. Why do I say moderately soluble? Well, because there's some anesthetics no longer used which are highly soluble. Anesthetics like diethyl ether and methoxyflurane, which have blood gas partition coefficients of above 10. For ether, it was about uh, 12, and for methoxyflurane, 15. So these are moderately soluble anesthetics. These are poorly soluble anesthetics. Note that the partition coefficient here is about 0.5, and here it's about Two. So memorize those values, if you will. The importance of solubility is not only in the blood, but also in the tissues, because that's going to be what's determining the difference between the alveolar and the venous partial pressure. After all, it's the tissues that stand between the arterial side of the circulation and the venous side of the circulation. They're what's causing this difference to occur. So we re really need to think about the tissue solubilities as well. Before we get to that, though, let's go back to this graph and think about what were the two messages there. One was that the curves were different in position. Why are they different in position? We know the answer now, don't we? The answer is? Solubility. Hey, you're terrific. 
So which is the least soluble antacid? And the most soluble? Halibut. And the other ones are in between. The other ones are in between. And so the higher the solubility, the greater the uptake, and therefore the greater the opposition to the effect of ventilation to drive the alveolar concentration upwards. And the lower this curve goes. And in a sense, the harder it is to develop anesthesia. <clears throat> the harder it is to develop anesthesia. And yet you say to me, look, I can give anesthesia and get a child anesthetized with halothane very quickly. How many of you have used halothane? Not many here. It's no longer used very much. But when we were using halothane, and we did use a lot of halothane, we would anesthetize children with it. You could get a child to sleep within a minute with halothane. Within a minute. And yet, that curve doesn't rise nearly as fast as does the curve with sevoflurane. But you can induce anesthesia, as I'm going to show you, almost as rapidly with halothane. How come? How could we do that? How could we? Greater MAC multiples. Exactly. So instead of giving just a 2 MAC, as you might, with sevoflurane, you gave 4 MAC or 5 MAC with halothane. The vaporizer would go up to 5%. You'd turn it all the way up and use a high flow. And so you'd compensate for this effect of solubility. And you'd get anesthesia in a minute or two. OK. As I said, we've got to also consider the tissue gas partition coefficients. Not only <coughs> blood, which you saw in the previous slide, that's the blood gas partition coefficient, but also anesthetic solubility in lean tissues like the brain and fat. We need to note that desferrin and nitrous oxide are very similar in terms of their solubilities in blood and in lean tissues. They're the least soluble of these anesthetics. But that they differ significantly in their fat solubilities, with desferrin being 10 times as soluble as nitrous oxide in fat. And as we learned in the study of mechanisms of anesthesia, that probably explains why desferrin is much more potent than nitrous oxide. At least it explains part of it. Sevoflurane, on average, is about twice as soluble as desferrin. And isoflurane, on average, is about twice as soluble as sevoflurane. If we had halothene on this chart, we would note that it is about twice as soluble as isoflurane. Now, the solubility and the blood flow to tissues determine how quickly tissues will equilibrate with the anesthetic delivered to them. And this, too, is reflected in the FAFI ratio. So we have several tissues, tissues that we need to consider. In fact, the body tissues can be grouped into four tissue groups that are defined by their time constants, some having short time constants, moderate time constants, and long time constants. The vessel-rich group is what its name implies. It's composed of those highly vascular tissues of the body. What would they be? Brain. 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 Thank you. <laughs> and what else? Is that the only highly vascular tissue? Liver. 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 Kidneys. 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 So we got brain, liver, including, the, of course, the intestine, the kidneys, and what else? Heart. Heart. And the heart. Those are the primary highly perfused tissues, make up about 9% of the body mass, but receive 3 quarters of the cardiac output. Three quarters of the cardiac output. So you've got a very high blood flow, a high flow relative to their capacity. So their time constant is going to be short, two to four minutes. It means that they're going to equilibrate to a 98% equilibration in what period of time? A very short period. A very short period. Can you be more specific if I said their time constants are two to four minutes? How long to 98%? Well, four time constants, so if it's two minutes, it'd be eight minutes. It'd be eight minutes. That's right. So 75% of the blood is going to return to the lungs with the same concentration as it had when it left the lungs in about eight minutes. The vessel-rich group will take up a lot of anesthetic initially. Why? Because it gets a big flow. Big flow. But this is going to narrow rapidly, and therefore its uptake will stop in eight minutes. After that time, uptake is going to be by the muscle group, composed of muscle and skin, which shares with muscle the same solvent and perfusion characteristics, and therefore the same time constant. But this tissue group, much bigger, 
has a much smaller blood flow. And therefore, its time constant is going to be what? Shorter or longer than with a vessel rich group? Much longer, much longer. 30 to 60 to 90 times longer than with a vessel rich group. The fat group is what its name implies. Why would we separate the fat group from the muscle group? Why not just lump them together? After all, they have about the same flow. If you look at the ratio of the flow to the volume, they aren't really that much different. So why would you separate them? Because of? Solubility. Thank you. Right. And which would have the greater solubility? The fat. And what would that do to the capacity of the fat to hold anesthetic? It'd be much larger. So the time constant for fat is much larger than the time constant for muscle. So after the muscle has come to equilibrium with the anesthetic, the fat is going to continue to take up anesthetic. And finally, we have the vessel pore group. Bones, ligaments, tendons, cartilage, those tissues of the body which are poorly perfused. In fact, their perfusion is essentially zero. If their perfusion is essentially zero, how much uptake can they command? Zero. zero, right. No flow, no uptake. So even though they make up nearly a quarter of the body mass, they don't contribute to the process. And the only tissue groups we need to consider are the fat group, the muscle group, and the vessel rich group. And a consideration of this is what explains the shape of the curves. We can now understand the shape of the curves as an initial rapid rise, which is the unopposed or partially opposed effect of ventilation driving the alveolar concentration upwards. Fast time constant, the half minute time constant. Why is it unopposed? Well, because at time zero, for example, there is no uptake. If there's no anesthetic in the lungs, what's the uptake? What's the uptake? Uptake equals this times this times an alveolar venous partial pressure difference, which must be zero if this is zero. So we have this rapid initial rise to a knee, that first knee, where there's a balance between the input by ventilation and the removal by uptake. And in fact, the balance is indicated by the position of that knee. So if the position were right here, if that were the first knee, we'd say that the uptake is determining about 40% of the anesthetic. That is, of the anesthetic being brought into the lungs, 40% is being removed by uptake. If it were down here, it would be 80%. That is, the rise would be to a point that's 20% of the inspired concentration. That's what you get with methoxyfluorine. With these, it's about 33%. 33%. Now, uptake slows at that point. But it continues to rise to that second knee over the course of about eight minutes. Which group is being saturated over that period of time? Vessel-rich vessel vessel rich group. And the end of that time indicates the end of the saturation of the vessel-rich group. We've got a slower rise after that as uptake by which group gradually decreases? Muscle. But it'd be the muscle group. Muscle group. So that explains the shapes of the curves, and why the shapes are the same for all of these. They're the same because the factors that affect one are the factors that affect others as well. Now, if solubility were the only factor, then all things being equal, induction of anesthesia would be most rapid with which anesthetic? Desperate. Desperate. And least rapid with? Alvary. But we know that's not true, because there's another factor that we have to Consider why is induction less rapid with desferrin than with an anesthetic such as sevoflurane? Because it's pungent agent. Pungent agent. That's right. And sevoflurane has a great advantage in its absence of pungency. This illustrates the pungency that exists at two mac. So if you look at the percent of unmedicated patients who are breathing anesthetic. Desferrin, isoflurane, sevoflurane at 2 mac who complain of respiratory irritation. 75% given desferrin complain, a little less than 50% of those given isoflurane, and none of them given sevoflurane. So sevoflurane's a pretty good anesthetic for induction of an anesthesia. It's got a low solubility, and it's got absent pungency. 
In fact, we make use of that to induce anesthesia with one breath, or what we call one breath, which often turns out to be three or four or five breaths. And look at this. Uh, Jennifer, what do you have planned? What we're planning on doing today is a one breath inhalation induction. So what we're going to do is have the patient take a large, large breath in, take a large breath out completely, and then we're going to have them take a vital capacity breath back in. Uh-huh. And th Sounds like every hold it and breathe normal after that. And you should fall asleep within about 60 seconds. Uh-huh. And sir, we've had to prepare you for that breathing exercise? Yes. Okay, great. Jennifer, what have you done back here? Basically, we've primed the circuit. We have high flow oxygen on, and we also have turn 8% sevoflurane on. You've chosen sevoflurane? Yes. Why is that? Basically, since it's a non-pungent anesthetic, we can increase to high MAC values and cause a fast inhalation induction, unlike some of the other anesthetics. All right, looks like we're ready to start. All right, you ready? Okay. Take a quick breath in. Breathe it out completely and fold it. And fold it back. Put the mask on your face. Okay, take a big, slow, deep breath in. Now hold it for a couple seconds. And now exhale. And just regular respirations. Jennifer, it looks like he's beginning to get drowsy. Mm. So he's still breathing. Yeah, so even the 8% sevoflurane enabled him to continue breathing. His eyelids are getting heavy now. Yeah. Brian, can you open your eyes for me? And he's losing his lid reflex. Pretty good. Pretty good. Good anesthesia and a terrific patient as well, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. And you can see that one breath produces anesthesia in about a minute of a high concentration of sevoflurane. Why isn't the patient asleep in one second? Why not? What's the obvious answer? No time for there isn't enough time to get the anesthetic taken up into the brain, isn't it? It's got to move from the lungs to the, to the brain. Okay, and there was this comment about, well, he's still breathing despite 8% sevoflurane. Why was he still breathing despite 8% sevoflurane? Jennifer, why was he still breathing? Basically, your body self-regulates if you have spontaneous ventilation to the amount that, of anesthetic that will be taken up. So what we've done is indicated that, in fact, 8% was not what he was getting in his lungs or in his brain, because 8% surely would have caused apnea to have occurred. So we have diluted the 8% with gases that remained in his lungs, and by the uptake of anesthetic, sevoflurane, including the uptake to tissue depots. We've chosen sevoflurane for this, and I think most of us would, would do that. We'll get into a little later why we would choose sevoflurane rather than halothane for induction. But I want to return to this issue of pungency of anesthetics. And we've said that pungency of anesthetics, like desferane, uh, will preclude us from using desferane from, for induction of anesthesia. But that presumes that this pungency extends over the entire range of concentrations that might be used with desferane. Let me show you this graph, though, which made one little change. One little change, and the change was, instead of 2 mac, 1 mac. At 1 mac, the percent of patients complaining of respiratory irritation with desferane, isoflurane, and sevoflurane is exactly the same. Zero. Zero. So maybe, maybe we could induce anesthesia with desferane if we keep that in mind. And keep in mind that there are other factors that can alter the perception of pungency. What other factors might alter the perception of pungency? Opioid administration. Opioid administration. So if we give a bit of premedication with fentanyl, 
maybe one mic per kilo, 50 to 75 mics of fentanyl. Well, of course, that depends on the weight of the patient, doesn't it? Yes. I was giving a talk on uptake in Omaha, and I said, now your average patient of 70 kilograms and a hen shot up to No, the average patient is 100 kilograms. Or morphine premedication, a tenth of a milligram per kilogram. Notice the big difference in comparison with the saline premedication on the percent of patients who cough on induction of anesthesia with desferrin. 25% here with saline premedication, but 5% with fentanyl. So we can really lower the perception of irritation. And with a knowledge of these things, let me show you. In fact, you all showed that induction of anesthesia with desferrin is easily possible. Roll them, kids. Senora, voy a darte el carete. Okay. Y puedes respirar despacio y profundo. Es el oxígeno. You have a nice mask fit. So we're inducing anesthesia with nitrous oxide and desferrin. The nitrous oxide is at about 60 percent. 60 percent. Inspired and 45 percent in time. The desferrin is at about 3 percent. Senora, baja la mano. Respira profundo y despacio. So we have a little excitement. I'm just going to reposition her head yeah. slightly. Pull the chin back a little more. Good. A little snoring now. So she's going to sleep now. And with the exception of that brief moment of excitement, that wasn't too bad an induction. Senora, puedes abrir los ojos? Because she's snoring, you're not going to communicate in any language at all. <laughs> okay, we have now up to 56% nitrous and 3.8% desferrin. She is still obstructed. I think it's time to put an oral airway in. Can you do that? Yes. Right. You're going to have to be very quick. Can you do that? Yes, sir. All right. Go for it. And now we've got a good end tidal reading, huh? Much better movement of the bag as well. OK, so we are four minutes into the induction and at a level sufficiently deep to allow you to insert an oral airway. Yes, sir. OK, it's just with desferrin nitrous oxide with some pre-medication with midazolam and a standard 100 micrograms of fentanyl. And that's all she's got. Now, the desferrin's at 5.2%. And that exhaled. is what kind of reading? It's our exhaled. It's an entital reading, isn't it? Does that mean her brain's at 5.2%? If her alveolar concentration should be 5.2%. So her brain would be there if it were at equilibrium. If it were. But we've only been going for five minutes with the brain having a time constant of maybe two or three or four minutes. So we need six or eight minutes before the brain will be at the concentration that we've got in the alveoli. So we're going to wait. Now for a full 10 minutes. And at that point, we'll see if we can get an LMA in without any other medication. You got to be quick again. OK. <laughs> <laughs> Who thought this couldn't be done with desferrin? I did. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you are. You can induce anesthesia uneventfully with desferrin. But you have to keep in mind that 6% barrier. That barrier that says, above this, we get irritation of the airway. Below it, there is no irritation of the airway. There is no coughing. There was no coughing, no laryngospasm, no problem at all. Now, we've talked about induction of anesthesia by inhalation. Is that the preference of most patients? No. The preference, usually, if you asked a patient, which would you prefer an inhalation induction or an intravenous induction. Most patients would prefer an intravenous 
induction of anesthesia. Some patients, in fact, have a claustrophobia that almost precludes an inhalation induction, whereas others, such as the, the patient who was induced or an, in whom anesthesia was induced with sevoflurane, it wasn't a problem at all. Let's now move to recovery from anesthesia. What are the factors that determine the rate of recovery from anesthesia? Let's name those. What would they be? Solubility. solubility. You always say solubility. <laughs> always say solubility. That's right. And solubility because it affects what aspect of the anesthetic? The rate of what? Washout. In this case, the rate of washout or elimination. So one factor would be elimination. And the other factor? Alveolar ventilation. It's going to be a ventilation because that affects elimination. The greater the ventilation, the greater the elimination. So that is a correct answer, but it doesn't add to what we've got here. What other, what other factor? Cardiac output. Again, it's going to affect elimination. Metabolism or? Uh, metabolism, again, will affect elimination. Which anesthetic would it affect? Well, halothane. Halothane. So halothane. You might wake up a little faster than you would otherwise because halothane is metabolized. But the other anesthetics that we're talking about, with a possible little bit exception of sevoflurane, really aren't metabolized. Visoflurane and desflurane aren't metabolized, and that's not going to affect their elimination. But there is a second factor, which is by the way. Mac ratio. That's it. That's it. Mac awake to Mac ratio. What is that for nitrous oxide? 60% or a little bit more. How about sevoflurane? 33%. 33%. percent Again, 33%. So you're going to have to get rid of relatively more desferane and sevoflurane than you're going to have to get rid of nitrous oxide to awaken from anesthesia. What about propofol? 19. 19 or 20%. That's right. You're going to have to get rid of even more propofol to reach an awake state. Why, uh, why is a rapid recovery desirable? We've gone over this. Let's repeat it, though. Go ahead. Uh, one factor is a hyperalgia issue. They would have less. So we're talking about hyperalgesia, mm -hmm. about pain. You'd think rapid recovery would increase pain. No, because hyperalgesia occurs at what concentration? about 0.1 mac. 0.1 mac, you get an actual increase in pain, at least experimentally in humans and experimentally in animals. So you want to get through that and get below that. What else is important? Rapid recovery. Why is rapid recovery important? The patient's able to maintain his or her airway, so safety is a reason. That's right. OK, any other reason? Cost. 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 How does this affect cost? Slower room turnover times. So we can get people out of the operating room and out of the PACU sooner. Solubility determines the rate of elimination. And for the most part, this is what you would predict. The alveolar concentration during elimination, the FA, relative to the last alveolar concentration during anesthesia, the FAO, shows the most rapid decrease with desferane, next most rapid with sevoflurane then isoflurane, and so forth. And we would predict, if elimination is the only factor then, that recovery should be most rapid with which anesthetic? Yes. And next most rapid? And next most rapid? Iso. OK. Let's consider the rapidity of recovery after sevoflurane relative to halothane anesthesia. And we'll consider that for children. The recovery, the emergence, and the time for fit for discharge is clearly shorter with sevoflurane than it is with halothane, particularly for emergence from anesthesia, a little more equivocally for fit for discharge. But several studies showing that patients, children given sevoflurane for anesthesia were fit for discharge sooner than their peers given halothane. Now, recovery is faster after sevoflurane uh, than after halothane study, halothane, 
Uh, but there is a price that's paid for this. What's the price that's paid for a more rapid recovery with SIBO fluorine? Don't you have increased agitation on wake up with SIBO fluorine? I think you do. Let's see that in an OR scene. Mike, they've uh, finished the squint surgery and now we're waking up. We've given no fentanyl whatsoever and uh, Donna's ready to extubate just as soon as the muscle relaxant's worn off. And we'll see what type of emergence we get out of this. Okay, I would expect that uh, without the fentanyl, we may get some agitation. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe what we can do is uh, give a little bit of fentanyl if uh, we see agitation and uh, show how that attenuates the uh, agitation. Okay. Ready. Mike, would you describe this as a, a normal wake up so far? Well, he's a little bit more agitated than we'd like to see. Uh huh. But this is certainly not atypical oh, okay. of a wake up, is it? It's no, okay. no. But this is what we oh, predicted. Uh -huh. Yeah, no, baby. Now, what could be a factor involved in this post operative excitement? Well, again, we know that uh, narcotics uh, can attenuate some of this uh, uh -huh. agitation upon wake-up. Yes. It certainly is multifactorial, but uh, we know the narcotics or sedatives could perhaps attenuate it. And, and we know that this agitation can go on for several minutes. In fact, can go on for a distressingly long period of time, 15, 20, 30 minutes for reasons that are not quite clear, but apparently relate at least in large part to analgesia. So if you give fentanyl or you give ketorolac before the uh, anesthetic is ended, you may find that you attenuate or eliminate the agitation. This can occur with sevoflurane. It seems to occur more with sevoflurane, uh, perhaps because they wake up quicker. It also occurs with desferane, which is, of course, an anesthetic from which awakening can be very rapid. Let's look at now recovery from anesthesia in adults. Uh, first look at it for brief outpatient procedures. Here are some data from Lone and coworkers showing the recovery rate after desferrin compared to isoflurin. The patients given desferrin indicated in this blue box were oriented sooner than those given isoflurin and were fit for discharge, perhaps uh, 15 minutes sooner than those given isoflurane. And similarly, we find that patients given sevoflurane are oriented sooner than those given isoflurane. So we see the sevoflurane bar here and the isoflurane bar here, and clearly the sevoflurane patients are awakening in a shorter period of time. That's for short procedures. How does the duration of anesthesia influence the rate of recovery. If we have a longer procedure, what would your expectations be in terms of the time to recovery, and why? Mike? It'd be longer because you have a washout that has to occur primarily maybe from the muscle groups and things like that. So the anesthetic, which has been deposited in the muscle, now comes out of the muscle. Where does it go? Into what blood? Venous. Into venous blood. And the venous blood travels where? back to the alveoli and, and okay. out. Al alveoli and out if it's cleared by ventilation. And what's going to determine its clearance? Solubility. Right, right. So if the anesthetic is very soluble, will it be cleared at the lungs? If it's very no. soluble, no. No. no, it won't. Remember, if it's very soluble, it likes the blood. It does not want to come into the alveolar gas. On the other hand, if it's poorly soluble, then ventilation will clear it from the lungs. And an increased duration of anesthesia may have little or no effect on recovery. Let's see about recovery after long anesthesia. Now here's a prolonged anesthetic. This is a five-hour anesthesia with desferrin as composed, compared to isoflurane. Notice that the difference between these two seems to have increased. The difference in terms of fit for discharge is now almost 40 minutes difference between desferrin and isoflurane. So things get longer. I can tell you that with a comparison of sevoflurane and isoflurane, 
we see the same sort of thing in time to orientation with sevoflurane showing the shorter time to orientation for an anesthetic that is three to five hours in length. And I will show you in a moment some other studies which again support the importance of solubility in terms of prolonged anesthesia. Let's also look at the patient as a factor in all of this. If we have an obese patient, what would you expect in terms of recovery? So you'd think, at first blush, prolonged recovery. And there are actually two thoughts that you have to consider, uh, one of which is obvious, and that is that the fat constitutes an enormous reservoir. But that, in fact, can be a factor that will accelerate recovery, because the fat reservoir, even for a long anesthesia, is not going to be filled and will extract anesthetic from the blood rather than contribute anesthetic to the blood because the partial pressure in the fat itself, the partial pressure is actually very low. So it may, in fact, accelerate recovery. The fat patient may wake up quicker. That's one thought. The second thought, though, is that there is a part of fat which has a much shorter time constant. It is the part of fat that is connected by proximity to highly perfused tissues, such as pericardial fat next to the heart, or perirenal fat next to the kidney, or mesenteric fat or omental fat next to the intestine and liver. Now that fat, that thin layer next to these highly perfused tissues, has a time constant that's probably maybe 200 minutes. And it does saturate in the course of a long anesthetic, or at least has an appreciable concentration, and can contribute to anesthetic during recovery from anesthesia and delay recovery from anesthesia. Juven has studied the recovery after anesthesia in obese patients, 130 kilograms, anesthetized for a fairly long period of time. They're having a gastric plication to manage their obesity. And the awakening after desferrin, six minutes. The awakening after isoflurane, more than twice that. The awakening after propofol, more than twice as long. A more rapid recovery, as we said earlier, may be important for several reasons, one of which is safety. And that's illustrated in Juven's study in terms of the saturation that the patients had, saturations being divided between those that were above 95% and those that were below 95%. This is in the patients as they return to the PACU and are receiving three liters per minute of oxygen via face mask. None of the patients who received desferrin, who were all awake, incidentally, had this desaturation or this extended desaturation. Those who were given isoflurane and propofol had an incidence of 42% having desaturation. Now, there have been many comparisons that we've been really taking from when we talked about isoflurane versus sevoflurane and isoflurane versus desferrin. There are also comparisons between desferrin and sevoflurane. The differences here should be less, and they should be less because the differences in solubility are less than they were for the comparisons that we made previously. Here's one comparison, though, a comparison by DuPont and coworkers. This is for middle-aged patients, premedicated, as you see, with sufentanil and propofol, and given nitrous oxide with either desferrin or sevoflurane or isoflurane in order to keep the blood pressure and heart rate within 20% of the control values, the awake values. And then they measured awakening after anesthesia and found a more rapid awakening after desferrin than sevoflurane, but not a more rapid awakening after sevoflurane than after isoflurane anesthesia. Why is recovery, in one more comparison, why is recovery after desferrin more rapid than after propofol anesthesia. Why would you suspect that propofol anesthesia might produce a slower recovery? Given the difference between the MAC awake and MAC value. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And the comparisons that have been made suggest that indeed recovery after desferrin is more rapid than recovery after propofol. On the other hand, recovery after a pure propofol anesthetic versus a pure desferrin anesthetic is different in 
the association with nausea and vomiting. There's going to be more nausea and vomiting after desferrin than there will be after the propofol anesthetic. Let's talk about recovery after anesthesia using combinations of inhaled anesthetics. Why, why might we want to combine anesthetics? Why, why might we want to combine anesthetics? You could decrease cost. You could decrease cost. And is this what you're thinking? Yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> All right. So we could use isoflurane for the maintenance of anesthesia. That's the inexpensive anesthetic. That's the cost issue. But is that the only thing you're going to be thinking about? Well, you would like to speed emergence, so you could substitute a more poorly soluble agent like desflurane for the isoflurane at the end of the case. So if you substituted the desflurane, you would hope to convert this from an isoflurane anesthetic to a desflurane anesthetic. And then you right. get the best of both worlds. You, as the title of the slide says, you could have your cake and eat it too. And let's see if, in fact, we can do that. To test this, we're going to give three anesthetics to the same people. So each person in this trial gets two hours of isoflurane at one and a quarter mac. Each person gets two hours of desflurane at one and a quarter mac. And then they also get one and a half hours of isoflurane at one and a quarter mac. And for the last half hour, the isoflurane is turned off, but there's some left because it doesn't leave the body right away. And we add desferrin in order to make the total one and a quarter mac. And here's what that looks like in terms of alveolar mac multiples. Turn off the isoflurane at 90 minutes, hour and a half. And here's the isoflurane coming out, that lavender line. And we add desferrin, not to one and a quarter mac, but in an amount such that this curve plus this curve equals one and a quarter mac. So we don't change the mac. And then at the end of that time, we turn off we turn off the anesthetic. And every minute, we ask the volunteer to open their eyes and squeeze our hand. And we find out how long it takes for them to respond to command. And we find that the volunteers given desferrin respond to command in 11 minutes. And those that are given isoflurane respond to command in 23 minutes. And the combination isn't any better than isoflurane by itself. The same thing is true of orientation. So where are you? San Francisco, San Francisco, in the Moffitt Hospital, Desferrin, 13 minutes, Isoflurane, 26 minutes, and the combination is any better. You can't have your cake and eat it, too. Now, you might criticize this. How would you criticize this? Turn the Isoflurane off earlier. You would turn off the Isoflurane earlier? Why not turn off the Desferrin earlier as well? You could. If you did, do you think that proportionately you would see the same difference? I'm not sure what you're asking. If you decrease both the desferrin mm -hmm. and the isoflurane, the effect of both will be attenuated. Mm -hmm. But it will be attenuated proportionately, won't it? It should be. So that the differences that you see here will be less for both, but will remain the same in terms of their relationship. Mm -hmm. So you always get a more rapid recovery with desferrin than you do with isoflurane. More rapid with sevoflurane than with isoflurane. More rapid with desferrin than with sevoflurane. Now let's talk about how the <coughs> anesthetic circuit can influence anesthetic uptake. We've got uh, several factors to consider here. What would, you, what would you think when I say the anesthetic circuit is going to influence induction of anesthesia, recovery from anesthesia? It's going to influence how much anesthetic you need. Why is that? What are the factors that come into play? Don't say solubility. Well, the volume that the um, anesthetic circuit uh, yeah. carries is going to be a factor. Right. So circuit wash in and circuit wash out. The volume that you've got to wash into and the volume you've got to wash out. That's what you have in mind, I assume. So one, the volume of the circuit. What else? Can certain anesthetics be absorbed in the circuit? Yeah. Which, which anesthetic? Halothane. Halothane is the primary one. The other ones are really aren't absorbed at all. So absorption by components. And then the most important of all is the third one. That will be flow through the circuit? It will be flow because flow influences what? Rebreathing. 
That's the answer. Say it louder. Rebreathing. Everybody, rebreathing. Re re Why is rebreathing important? What does rebreathing do? Go ahead. Well, once, you, once the anesthetic is eliminated from the lungs, you want to get it out of the circuit so that it's not brought back to the patient again. Okay, that's right. That's right. And what about during induction of anesthesia or the delivery of anesthesia? Why is rebreathing important then? It helps maintain the concentration in the circuit. It does help maintain it if what has not happened. It hasn't gotten diluted. Or by diluted by what? High gas flow rates. No, we're going to say, let's suppose that the flow rate is low. Okay. And we're now rebreathing gas that have been exhaled by the patient. What has the patient done to the exhaled gases? He's, he's uh, been uptake in the alveoli. So some of the anesthetic has been removed. Right. If a lot has been removed, the rebreathing is going to dramatically lower the concentration. If only a little bit has been removed, then it's going to have little effect. And we're going to see that this can dramatically influence both the inspired concentration and ultimately the alveolar concentration at low flows. Why are we concerned about low flows? Cost. <laughs> OK. That's right. Because of cost. So we want to get the flows down. Let's look at the results for three patients who were given low flow rates, one liter per minute, each with a different anesthetic. Queen, we're using a high dose of fentanyl on this case, in addition to propofol. But you have some other anesthetic objectives to add a volatile agent. Tell me what you'd like to do. Well, what we'd like to do is demonstrate the uptake of isofluorine at a low flow. So our plans are to keep the flow at one liter per minute and observe the uptake in a FA to FI ratio of isofluorine delivered at a constant delivered concentration of 1.5% with the ultimate goal of achieving alveolar concentration of approximately 1 mac or 1.2%. And how long do you think something like that would take at such a low flow? Well, given the low flow and the relative solubility of isofluorine compared to desflurane, it's going to take a long time. All right, you mentioned the ratio. Why don't we Go ahead and turn on our isofluorine at okay. your planned concentration, and we'll follow some numbers to see what happens. Uh, we have turned the dial to a delivered concentration of 1.5% isofluorine. We well, Quinn, we're at 31 minutes now. We've been waiting a long time for our isofluorine level to increase. Have we gotten very far with it? Not very far. We've gone from about a third of a MAC to MAC to, well, a fourth of a, or four tenths of a MAC, 40%. Uh, our F8 to FI ratio has increased to about two thirds, two -thirds now, so yes. it is climbing. But the inspired concentration is far below the delivery concentration. The delivery concentration was 1.5%, and the inspired at 30 minutes is only 0.65 because of the rebreathing. In fact, we could plot the whole curve. There's the inspired relative to the delivered, several points in time. So the delivered concentration is 1, that is 1.5%, in fact. And as a percentage of that, the inspired concentration is only 40% of that. So you're going to have to raise the delivered concentration in order to raise the alveolar concentration to what you want it to be. With isofluorine, a moderately soluble anesthetic, the rebreathing dramatically lowers the inspired concentration, and perforce then must dramatically lower the alveolar concentration, even lower. Relative to the delivered concentration, at 30 minutes, the alveolar concentration is 25 to 30 percent of the delivered concentration. What's that going to be when we substitute a less soluble anesthetic? What's going to happen to those curves? They'll increase. They'll increase. So let's see it with sevoflurane. Well, we're going to demonstrate washing of sevoflurane at a low flow uh, system. So we've turned our total gas flow down to one liter per minute of oxygen. And we're going to set the sevoflurane to a delivered concentration of approximately 2.8% and leave it there and watch our concentrations as they change. Why don't you turn it on? OK. So we're going to turn to approximately 2.8% sevoflurane, uh, just over a MAC, maybe around 1.2, 1.3 MAC. Correct. Right. We're at 30 minutes now. And taking a look uh, 
in our time, 30 minutes, and our end tidal concentration, we now have a 76% ratio, and uh, it doesn't seem to have changed much. No, I think we've reached the plateau portion of the curve at this point. So it's just as Jennifer predicted. The inspired concentration relative to the delivered concentration, the vaporizer setting, is much higher for sevofluorine than it is for isofluorine. Same amount of rebreathing, but of gases now that have been exhausted of their anesthetic by a lesser amount because sevofluorine is less soluble. Less is taken up than is the case with isofluorine. But even that says that sevofluorine's inspired concentration is not the same as the delivery concentration, and the alveolar concentration will accordingly be affected. So the alveolar concentration is perhaps 50% of the concentration that we're delivering. Well, let's see now what happens with Desferrain. And we would predict what, Jennifer? What are we going to predict? It'll increase even further. It'll increase even further. When we're giving one liter per minute of oxygen, we're going to about to turn on the Desferrain. Why don't you do that okay. and go to 8%. Very good. And now we're going to watch how quickly the Desferrain concentration rises. Okay, Quinn, can you, can you give us an update? Well, we're now 30 minutes into our anesthetic with a delivered concentration of 8% Desferrain and a flow rate of one liter a minute. And you can see the alveolar concentration of Desferrain fell just short of my prediction of 6%. It's actually 5.6%, which is 70% of the delivered concentration. Your, your vaporizer is a poor man's analyzer. More so with a poorly soluble anesthetic. Yes. Right, exactly so. So with Desferrain, the inspired concentration relative to the delivered is again even higher than with sevofluorine, just as, as was predicted. The inspired concentration, in fact, now is above 80% of the delivered concentration, even at this low flow rate of one liter per minute, because uptake of desferrine is relatively small. And the alveolar concentration is about 70% of the delivered concentration. And as Quinn and I said at this point, this uh, means that the delivered concentration, where you look at the dial setting, can be your poor man's anesthetic analyzer. You can say that the two are not all that far apart. You can control the anesthetic in the alveoli by what you deliver, even at this low flow rate. Now I want you to notice the separation of these curves. The separation is considerable. The desferrain curve is about two and a half to three times the isofluorine curve. Big separation of those curves, which is vastly different from the separation that you see with a non-rebreathing system. That is, the lower the flow rate, the greater the exaggeration of the effect of uptake because of rebreathing. Why is this important? What implications does it have for control of anesthesia? Where do you get the better control of anesthesia? At higher flow, higher flow. At higher flow rates and with what kind of anesthetic? An anesthetic with a low solubility. Low solubility. That's right the answer half the time. What about for the cost of anesthesia? What implications does it have there? Which is going to be more costly if you have to consider raising the delivered concentration to get the alveolar concentration where you want it to be? With low flow, rebreathing becomes more important. And cost becomes more of an issue with the more soluble anesthetic. So the more soluble the anesthetic, the greater you have to raise the delivery concentration. And it's the delivered concentration that costs you. It isn't the inspired concentration or the alveolar concentration. It's what you have to deliver that costs you. Now let's talk about nitrous oxide. Nitrous oxide is different from the potent inhaled anesthetics in several ways. That very statement tells you what I want you to answer me now. How does nitrous oxide differ from the potent inhaled anesthetics? First of all, it has a MAC that's above an atmosphere, so it's used 105% of right. atmosphere. So we have to deliver it at high concentrations. 
And that has implications that are physical in terms of their uptake. We think of nitrous oxide as a poorly soluble anesthetic, and indeed it is relative to the potent inhaled agents except for uh, desferrin and to a lesser extent uh, sebofluorine. But the absolute quantity of anesthetic carried in the blood with desferrin versus nitrous oxide is vastly different, not because of any difference in solubility, but because of a difference in the partial pressure that's applied to the blood. The amount of nitrous oxide that's carried in the blood is rather substantial. And this has effects on gas-containing cavities within the body. It has other kinetic effects that we'll discuss in a moment. But if you carry a large volume of some gas in the blood to a cavity, it means that that gas now can expand what's in the cavity, particularly if what's in the cavity is a poorly soluble gas like nitrogen or sulfur hexafluoride, which cannot be carried away from that cavity. The solubility of nitrous oxide, again, is significantly greater than the solubility of these other gases like nitrogen. And that influences its diffusion through membranes, such as the membrane that might surround a cuff that composes a cuff. And we have a little experiment that uh, shows you the effect of So we developed an in vitro model here. of diffusion of nitrous oxide into the cuff of an endotracheal tube. What we have is the end of an endotracheal tube, which has been sealed within this buretrol. So I'm going to partially inflate the cuff with five cc's of air. And you can see the cuff is about half inflated there. We have our circuit hooked up to the other end. We're going to turn on some nitrous oxide in a very high concentration. And you'll see on the monitor the nitrous oxide concentration is going to gradually rise. It'll take it a few minutes. You can now see that we have an inflow and an outflow of 72% nitrous oxide and 28% oxygen. What we'll do is we'll check back in an hour, and the cuff of the endotracheal tube should be markedly distended from diffusion of nitrous oxide from the inside of the buretrol to the inside of the cuff. So returning after an hour of 70% nitrous oxide, we see the cuff has become markedly more distended. The clinical correlation to this is that following a prolonged anesthetic with nitrous oxide, the cuff could become distended, as seen here, resulting potentially in tracheal mucosal ischemia. That's a pretty good demonstration. And it does indicate the clinical significance that potentially correlates with this expansion of the endotracheal tube cuff. What are the other spaces within the body that could be expanded by nitrous oxide that are of concern to us? In your ear. Is that expanded, or is the pressure increased in the inner ear? The pressure. And what, what, what determines whether it's going to be a pressure increase or a volume increase? It's compliance. compliance. The compliance of the space. So the inner ear is a fairly non-compliant, or relative to other cavities, it's fairly non-compliant. So that's a pressure increase. What are the spaces within the body that can expand in volume? The lungs. The lungs, meaning a pneumothorax. Mm -hmm. OK, what else? The abdomen, the intestinal. The intestines, <laughs> right, right. Anything else? An, an abnormal space within the body. Pneumocephalus or something like that? A pneumocephalus, but that would be the pressure again. Because like the inner ear, that's a poorly compliant space. Air embolus. An air embolus. Who said that? Say it again. What else? Air embolus. An air embolus. That's right. And that can expand dramatically because of the presence of nitrous oxide. Pressure can increase in the inner ear, or the middle ear, rather. It can increase in a pneumocephalus and in one unnatural thing, where else can it increase? Intraocular. Intraocular, if we inject gas into the eye. And we'll see that in a bit. Nitrous oxide also has effects on gas spaces within the lungs during the uptake and the elimination of uh, nitrous oxide. In the elimination, we have a phenomenon called diffusion hypoxia, where the outpouring of nitrous oxide, the large volumes that can be placed into the lungs, dilute the other gases in the lungs, including the oxygen. And during induction of anesthesia, we have two phenomena. 
that results from the large volume uptake of nitrous oxide. What are those two phenomena? What are they? The concentration effect. Right. And also the second gas effect. And also the second gas effect, which really is the same thing but applied to different gases. So here's an experiment which illustrates both the second gas effect and the concentration effect. This is an experiment in which either 65% nitrogen, nitrous oxide, or 5% nitrous oxide was given to patients. And the FAFI ratio was measured. When 65% nitrous oxide was given, the rate of rise of the alveolar concentration towards the inspired concentration, the FAFI ratio, was more rapid than when 5% was given. Desrain at about 4% was given in both of these cases. It was given with the 65% nitrous oxide and with a 5% nitrous oxide. And when it was given with 65% nitrous oxide, the rise was more rapid than when it was given with 5% nitrous oxide. This illustrates the concentration effect, that is, the greater rate of rise of nitrous oxide with a higher concentration. And this, affects, this illustrates the second gas effect, the more rapid rise of the desferrin when it was given with 65% nitrous oxide. Dr. Rieger? Yes, please. Does the second gas effect work on elimination with nitrous oxide? Uh, a little bit, but not nearly as much. Not nearly as much. So it's, um, it really is a trivial effect on elimination. That is, can you eliminate things more rapidly because you're giving nitrous oxide? The answer is yes, but only a little bit. And we can go into why, but it's too long. <laughs> Any other questions before we go on to the next chapter, which is genetic and immune? Yes, please. Does the nauseating effects of nitro nitrous oxide uh, affect whether you administer it towards the end of an anesthetic at all? That's going back to that earlier one. Now, which one are we thinking of here? Let's see. Does the nauseating effect determine whether you administer it towards the end of the anesthesia? Um, we're going to get to that in another way, which is to say that we can, we can minimize the nauseating effect of nitrous oxide by limiting the concentration to 50% or less. At 50% or less, uh, in volunteers who are awake, the effect of nitrous oxide to produce nausea is minimal. At 60 to 70%, uh, volunteers given that and nothing else vomit repeatedly. So it may not be a matter of whether you give it at the end or in the earlier part of anesthesia. What matters more, really, I think, is the concentration that you give. 